1983, the first year of the dangerous sports club skiing races. Members gather in the famous resort of Samaritz in the Swiss Alps. Rules for entry are quite simple, providing there is an unusual object somewhere between you, the skis and the piste, an object that would not usually be found in a ski resort, then you can enter. Oh, and you have to buy and construct the vehicles yourself, or borrow Granny's invalid carriage, Mother's ironing board, or a neighbour's horse trough. Only you that's got a busted neck. Well, I can get down, you see, below the... One must always dress with style, be brave, and be a little mad as well. It's fantastic, the idea of going to Switzerland and being able to build all these machines. The first time I did it, I only did the desert island. It's actually a wooden base mounted on the skis with a polystyrene mound on top and then a shark on the back with a palm tree in the middle. It was impossible to steer, you just had to sit on it and just hope. And we had no control, which is the reason we hit the JCB. I think the most dangerous device or contraption that, that went down from a visual point of view was, was undoubtedly the um, rowing aid. To my mind, the first ski race was really Hugo Spowers' event. Hugo is a great engineer, and this is what you need in something like this, is not just to come up with the wacky ideas, but then be able to put a rowing aid and uh, put it on skis and make it so that the whole thing actually worked. By turning the back of the boat left, the boat will point to the right. The real problems right. with the steering was the, the rowing aid, um, because the, the, the rowing aid was supported on four pairs of skis, and I was the cox at the back of that. We had nine people in it with, with their oars and so on. The idea being that when it hits the snow, it doesn't catapult the man out of the boat. It just, we just let the oar go. Just jobs the guy in front. Just jobs the guy in front. <laughs> the rear pair of skis that uh, were steerable underneath my legs um, were more often than not off the snow. So there was pressure little I could do to control the direction. And even when they were on the snow, I tended to get my legs tangled up in them and they got twisted up underneath me. So it was all a bit of a, a fast the, the steering on that one. At that point, there had been eight fairly heavy people on board and it had picked up quite a lick. So it broke up halfway down as all of us were going down trying to manipulate our oars and we were all thrown out. But the enduring image I always have of that is of Hugo Spars valiantly carrying on right at the head of this. If you don't succeed at first, well, have another go yourself. By the time it got down, it was going really pretty fast, and Hugo he was quite clearly not in control of this thing, although uh, amazingly managed to get it down in, in one piece. My entry, I think, the first year was, was in, in a sofa which was very nice because you, you, could, you, you had this sofa on the top of um, the Alps and you were sitting there most of the afternoon drinking and carrying on. And then when it was time to go, you just got something to give you a little bit of a push. I went down with Bruce Biscuit and an inflatable doll and it was all like, you know, fun and games. Graham Chapman of Monty Python's Flying Circus fame was a member of the club. Well, I think it's... It's an adrenaline fix. Every so often he'd come off on one of our stunts and I think he'd have a real good time with it. Because of, because of, because of danger. He got a sort of wicked, very dry sense of humour. I mean, he was a hard guy to warm up. Oh, I think that's very healthy. His great entry of the 85 ski race was going to be an operating table. I remember him dressed up in like surgical gear with this operating table on skis and huge amounts of industrial blood drawing up some body, which I think was a side of beef or something like that. But it really disgusting. Blood and flesh going everywhere and there's blood all over the ski slopes. And, you know, again, the Swiss get very freaked out by the whole thing. But, uh, um, and then we, we tried the gondola. Uh, Fitzroy was there in his um, guardsman's uniform with his bearskin hat. And he was hanging onto the back of the gondola, trying to steer it with his feet, which was absolutely fine until the gondola started going sideways and accelerated very rapidly to about 40 miles an hour. And the whole thing ended up um, sort of matchwood. When you think of the, the relative dangers involved, although always controlled dangers, and the fact that so few of us have ever got hurt, I think, is a, really is, is, is a credit to the organisation. There was a definite progression from the size of the entries in the 83 ski race, which was the first one, to the 84 ski race. Things were much bigger and more flamboyant. But the second time, 
It was so good that I built about four machines and, you know, I spent lots of money. It was brilliant. It was just so enthusiastic, so enjoyable. At the end of the day, you walk out of that and you think, boy, I was lucky. But somehow or other, intuitively, you know the ones that are going to work out. David had been along the National Theatre and said he could get anything that would, be, that would look good going down the slopes in Simmeritz. And he'd managed to get hold of a horse, a huge horse, which David and Cosmo rode down the slope. It was fun, all the way through, just pure, pure fun. Mike uh, Boyd Mansell hurt his back quite badly too. He had, he had a truly spectacular accident in a pre-war invalid carriage. Uh, he did a cartwheel. He would must have been doing 60 miles an hour when he cartwheeled in that. In that goddamn invalid carriage which crashed and nearly killed Mike Boyd Mansell. I mean, some of these things were lethal. Yeah, my back then, it's my back. Uh, it's all right, it's okay. It was very important to do or die or try, but with style. Even a failure was good. As long as you did it with some style or you made an effort. You go through, will it work, won't it work? David himself went down in a C5. If it does work, what problems are you going to have? That had an absolutely horrendous crash. If it doesn't work, what problems you're going to have? Oz looked dangerous. It wasn't as dangerous as the next time when I did the uh, cruise missile. It was built for speed. It was, it was a very, very fast machine. It had no, no brakes or steering. We were very confident that it'll just go down in a straight line right over the bumps and stop at the bottom on the snowbank. When we reached the bottom, there was a flat plane before the snowbank and we were just so relieved to get down. We waved to everybody. We must have been doing close to 80 miles an hour. We were going much faster than we should have done. I mean, we were going like a missile. Although the slope did get a bit shallower at the bottom, we had to build a, a sort of four or five foot high snowbank um, after the finish for people to crash into if they hadn't crashed already. The next thing we knew, we were on top of the snowbank and going down over onto another piece. Beyond the trees was a sheer drop into the town. We tried to tried to knock the missile over, but we couldn't. And eventually we just slammed into a tree. There was five foot of solid polystyrene in front of us, and that just disintegrated into tiny beads. And we were just left wrapped around a tree. We were keen just to get back up the slope and find something else to come down on. Tim Hunt and I went down on his tandem bicycle. Um, fortunately, I mean, um, high spirits got, I think, the better of some of us, and um, you know, ended up with, uh, shall we say, a few problems. On another year, I was in this racing car which went over the side of the hill at, at a slightly wrong angle, and I crashed uh, and had this nail go through the through my leg. Something I wasn't really aware of at all at the time. And that, that, I suppose, to me, was uh, a relatively um, uh, difficult time. Well, there were no dignified ends to any of the runs, I'm afraid. The steering mechanism for the Grand Piano was particularly esoteric. We had three sort of fiberglass floats for a catamaran under the three legs, and the front one was steerable. And it was steerable by a piece of string that went across the keyboard. Uh, but because we had nothing to hold on to, at the last minute we got hold of a barrow and we tied it to the string in the middle of the piece of string, halfway between the two of us. So we were fighting over this barrow, pulling it backwards and forwards. But there was a lot of backlash in the system and really it didn't work very accurately.
Exercise bikes, prams, anything goes when you're in a dangerous sports club. That was going like a rocket! Oh, my lovely! Oh. <sighs> Great entries that year. I loved some of the things, particularly that invalid carriage was just fabulous. The Mark Hammond Trophy for the happiest flight and the most carefree landing is awarded to Mike Boyd Mansell. <laughs> 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 Bungee jumping, the club's outstanding contribution to 20th century sport and culture, starts here in Oxford, discreetly, in 1979. Pretty soon they are reaching new heights. But it's here, in Bristol, where it all begins, at the Clifton Suspension Bridge. This is the site of the first bungee jump. As you can see, it's about 250 foot above high water. The sensations of jumping are an interesting one. The first thing you've got to do is to find the courage to, to step off to what you feel is going to be a certain depth. The idea of bungee jumping was inspired from the vine jumpers of New Guinea. Where their idea came from, I, I don't know. I believe it's some sort of rite of passage. And it made a, a lasting impression on me. When I was a boy at prep school, um, there was a master who asked us to read this story out of the National Geographic magazine, which described the New Guinea vine jumpers proving their manhood by tying these vines to their ankles and jumping off. It had quite a, a powerful appeal for me, that. I'd been involved in the hang gliding school, and we used to tie the hang gliders to the roof of a car with ordinary luggage straps, and they wore out quite quickly. And I discovered that we could get far superior bungee rope from the local ship's chandlers, which came in 100-metre rolls. And so I ordered up four or five ropes, which were about a third of the length of uh, the height of a Clifton suspension bridge. We chose Clifton Bridge because it was the tallest in England, and it was only a stagger away from Chris's flat. Some friends of mine from, from Oxford had run some computer simulations of what would happen. Uh, Chris and, and David had decided it would be very unseemly or unmanly to actually test it with a, with a, with a, a weighted bag. We didn't try out the ropes before. Unfortunately, you couldn't really try them out. Being an engineer, I knew just how reliable these models really were. Various friends and medical people advised us that it was extremely dangerous. I don't like to take huge risks. We might break our neck or break our back. I really didn't want to do it. If we got the calculations wrong and hit the water too hard, it could have have fatal results. The first bungee jump was, was really an April Fool's joke. The plan goes ahead. Invitations are sent out. Urban bungee jumping for the masses has finally arrived. As far as I'm concerned, it was April the 1st coming up and I'm going to be doing this and I don't really quite know what's going to happen. You're sort of not booking any space in your diary after April the 1st because you're not really quite sure there's any point. I'd um, made all the arrangements and organised all the rope and organised the party in my apartment which was just a few hundred yards down the, down the road overlooking, overlooking a gorge. Both my sisters had separately called the Bristol police to ask them to arrest me and anybody else who was about to do this because they were convinced that we were all going to die. In the warehouse, Simon Keeling was sound asleep on a pile of ropes, which uh, showed a certain self wire I believe. The party was a great success and we all had way too much fun and as a result, no one showed up at dawn. It took us until about 10 or 11 to get organised and get our ropes together and by that time the police had gone. I'd sort of thought quite carefully about what, what the bungee jumping was about. I don't think that anybody really took it that seriously. 
And actually, it wasn't that dangerous. My girlfriend had been very unamused by my, my suicide attempt as she saw it and had refused to come to the party. However, in the middle of the night, she decided she ought to come down, so I drove up to London to, to collect her. Chris had disappeared on his motorbike. None of us knew where he had gone to. And didn't come back until about seven or eight. And after an endless debate, we decided we couldn't wait for Chris to come back, simply because we just had to get on with things before traffic built up, and that was it. We got to the bridge, and I can remember being very shaky and, and nervous. And I remember thinking very distinctly, where on earth are the police when you really need them? I got back from London to find, to my disbelief, my fellow club members presumably got in such a state they felt they could no longer wait. Nobody was more disappointed than any of us that Chris didn't arrive. I remember thinking, this isn't going to work. I really don't want to do this. I mean, it hadn't occurred to me, but as it was my idea, my ropes, my party, and as far as I was concerned, my bridge, that um, they would conceivably jump without me. David jumped. He was the first one to, to go off. I wanted to get up and stand on the bridge and step smartly off, but we were so wrecked to the party, I thought I'd probably collapse back onto the pavement. And I put a, a scarf around my face because I sure didn't want my mother to recognise me at the next morning's daily paper. Simon and Alan, being prudent engineers, waited to see what would happen to me. After he started coming back again, I remember thinking, oh, it works, we're going to all have to do it now. So at that point, Simon and I jumped off simultaneously. It was a very odd feeling because it felt like jumping over a fence or a gate, except that there was nothing underneath, nothing. So it was like a very, very, very soft feeling. And, and then I'm um, sort of plunging down. I remember at first, Terrible fear letting go of the bridge. After that, an exciting feeling of falling through the air. Tim Hunt, being a bohemian artist, was fractionately late. The irony was that Valentine Guinness had always said he had a dream and the fourth man was going to wipe out. So there was poor old Timo um, saying, Crikey, I'm number four. It was just such a wonderful feeling, you know. It's when you go off a bridge or something, you think, Crikey, no one has been in this place before. No one has actually been hanging in the air where you've been. That's the fun of it. You know, it's unique. Sensations crowding in. You think, that bridge up there, nobody's ever seen the bridge from this point of view. For some reason, the bridge was suddenly shut. And I suppose the police had shut it. I always knew the police would arrive when I was hanging under the bridge because that's what police do do. And they were particularly annoyed that they'd missed us having been there earlier. It was just a question if they arrived after the jump rather than before it. The police eventually show up and immediately enter into the spirit of the occasion. Unfortunately, the long arm of the law isn't long enough, so the intrepid jumpers are pulled in for questioning by volunteers. worth getting arrested for. I do appreciate that it's necessary to oh, turn up <laughs> mundane things like magistrate's court. <laughs> 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 oh, right. Oh, oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm brilliant. There we go. The police, I guess, didn't really know quite how to handle it in the sense that they weren't, they didn't have a sort of precedent for it. Can you just tell us what's going on here? No, not for a man. But they were, they were, they were perfectly friendly. Was it worth getting arrested for? Hey? Well, was it worth getting arrested for? I think so. How do you feel after fun. this escapade? It's very exhilarating. It's a tremendous what feeling. What was the idea behind it? I don't know, it's crazy. <laughs> we were all put in the, in the car and we were taken down to Bristol. And I just remember stopping at the traffic lights at one point and thinking, shall I dive out of this car and run for it? <laughs> After you've jumped, you are just so pleased and happy with the world. I personally was just resigned in the back seat. You've got your sums right and to hell with the fines. I was robbed of the, of the chance to actually see what it was like to step off a bridge in cold blood not knowing whether it was going to work or not. He unfortunately ended up missing the first bungee jump. I mean, subsequent jumps were less interesting because the idea was proven. In fact, I think he missed all of them. From here, bungee jumping and its counterpart, reverse bungee jumping, captures the imagination of the public and becomes the craze of the 1980s. Even Father Christmas gets the bungee bug, so to speak, even if he does give himself a dunking. Jumping takes place from bridges and from cranes, 
cranes being slightly more legal and, of course, safe as houses. Well, nearly, anyway. The club spreads its wings and heads for more challenging structures. It's time to export this unique product. We flew out to San Francisco. We went to have a look at the bridge. We thought we could have a sort of recce. Alan, who'd been out there, said, I think we ought to go out and have a quick look at it. There's a slight thing, I think we ought to think about this. The Golden Gate Bridge isn't a simple suspension bridge, or it's not a, it doesn't have a clean edge to it. So you have to clamber quite a long way to get to a point where you're looking straight down to the water. The depth of the spans between the surface of the road, as it were, and the bottom of the bridge is 40 or 50 feet. Now, the height of the bridge from the road to the sea is about 250 feet. It happens to be about the same as at, at Clifton. I mean, the risk, what we were worried about was that the bouncing back up and just bouncing into the bottom of the bridge, you see. Because, of course, we'd done one, so we knew that it worked perfectly OK. And we looked at it, and we looked at each other. We looked back at the bridge and said, yeah, well, probably OK. That was the only thing that was really sort of dodgy about that. And I suppose we were world experts in bungee jumping at that point. We all wondered how close we'd come up to to actually smack into the bridge on the way up. Uh, it turns out it was fine and we, we all missed the bridge, although I think, um, I think Peter came pretty close to it. I remember that Chris had a, a particular problem with getting his ropes untangled. In fact, he didn't get them untangled before the police showed up and they arrested him on top before he was able to jump. I practiced, along with Simon Keeling, to make sure that our escape technique was gonna work. We, we had second lines inside our shirts, which we had planned to slide down and then scramble into a boat that was underneath the bridge. Everybody else uh, was having too much fun the night before to, to uh, take the time to do that and uh, consequently got stuck, got arrested, and got thrown in jail. We zoomed off to the, the side, which ended no distance at all. And we jumped out of the boat. The boat sped off somewhere. We had a car waiting at the side that was going to whisk us off to the airport. The journalists were so quick onto it, and they were reporting it all in five minutes flat. It's 9.07. Well, there's been a weird story today, that's for sure. We heard about 30 minutes ago the report of three people over the side, bungee jumping. That's what it's all about. I've got a feeling there's more to that story, and we'll pick it up later from the others on News Radio. It was entertaining to drive through San Francisco on the way to the airport and listen to, to uh, news reports of, of the event, and also to hear about us um, being, being wanted by the police as we, as we headed off to the airport. Whenever there was some complete madman came into the DSC, there always turned out to be somebody came in who was even crazier. You know, I mean, you take someone like, I mean, Fitzroy. He was somersaulting over bars and all sorts of other stuff. He wouldn't think twice about it. He was almost like an acrobat, that guy. <laughs> I remember he once jumped off this 60-foot bridge without even looking what was underneath. I mean, you know, great bloke, but I mean, really bananas as far as I'm concerned. We were at Sam Ritz, uh, staying at the Chanterella Hotel. Fitz, he managed to get about 15 or 16 D1 detonators in. Uh, they make a very big bang. I remember that we'd been letting them off, and Baker went to console the concierge, or the manager of the, the hotel, that there would be no more bangs. Bit down, something like that. Yeah, they're, they're very small, there's no real problem. You, 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 you miss them, you yeah. see oh, the yes. alarm is going on. Oh, I see, yes, yeah. okay. No, okay, if you're there's yeah. no yeah. Yeah. The club members always let their hair down in the evenings. All the way to the floor, in fact. And you know, we all thought he was nuts. And then, like, Hugo Spowers comes in. I hit the ground very hard. Skydiving out of a helicopter. Broke my neck in two places. Into a speedway station. Broke my back in two places. At night. Broke my pelvis twice. In gale forth winds. Shattered ten teeth. With a broken leg and plaster. <laughs> I mean, give me a break, give me a break, give me a break. I mean, I really did a, 
comprehensive job on myself. And so we all think he's pretty daft. Um, and then Mark Chamberlain comes along, I mean, who is certifiable. I was, I was slightly insane, I suppose. What do we call him? Mad child, because he made everybody else look very sane and very grown up. Why was I called a mad child? I think partly because I was probably the most anarchistic in the club. Whenever you're ready, Mark. I've got a bit of a problem with the Dan Stoll there. I mean, he's completely nuts. Taking it down when learning. Always down. One of the things that made me laugh more than anything else was the reports of Dave floating across the English Channel in a, in a helium balloon kangaroo. This pilot, I think, slightly irked by not finding a UFO, but finding what he could reasonably assume to be a, an unauthorised pilot in territory he thought was his own. The, the pilot on the jumbo jet didn't really know how to respond to it. He spotted a, a, a kangaroo at 10,000 feet, and it's pink, and reports it back to radar control. <laughs> I mean, there's no sort of formula for, for responding to that, apart from, well, just full left rudder and dive or something. <laughs> OK, time for cream beat. Time for a cream tea. Yes! It isn't long before the dangerous sports club takes off in Japan. These guys are, are actually sort of were sent over to challenge us. We'd put our heads together and came up with quite an amusing little schedule over about four or five days. The DNC uh, at home. Hi. Yeah. We didn't know anything about their background or their history, and we greeted them as friends. And Willie Purcell spoke excellent Japanese. Of course, Willie was at pains to assure them in lines with their own understanding that uh, this was a normal English breakfast. Shinji. Shinji. Come by. Come on, come on, come on. We can imagine these guys have never been abroad in their life before. There was a certain cultural confusion and their worst horror stories are coming to life. For breakfast, uh, we'd got one of the local Indian restaurants to provide a uh, really ring stinging curries. The Japanese television companies soon latch on to the madcap ethos of the dangerous sports club. Nothing could be closer to their idea of a fun day out than the apparently masochistic sporting exploits of the club. Chicken Vindaloo is not exactly breakfast at Tiffany's, but probably more manageable than porridge followed by prunes. However, there is a sting in the tail, so to speak. What they didn't know is that somebody had laced uh, the curry with this stuff called, I think it's called laxophil, which is this sort of medical stuff where, you know, people have serious bowel problems and they, they have to have a bowel problem in half an hour or they die. I mean, it's the equivalent of swallowing a depth charge. <laughs> they came over full of noise and thunder and commotion. And, um, seeing them destroyed by a plate of vindaloo was an exquisite.